How should we think about the minds of other animals? Let's take dogs, for example. How many of you, either now or at some point in your life, have had the good fortune of living with a dog? All right, many of you. Um, if so, then this expression may be familiar to you. Yes? Seeing some recognition? What are these dogs feeling? In answering questions like this, our, our usual human tendency is to view other animals in our image, projecting human-like characteristics onto other animals. So to explain the mind of a dog, or any animal for that matter, we look to our own mind as a guide, as if other animals are merely furrier, feathered, um, scalier versions of us. This tendency to view animals in human terms is part of a larger view of the world known as anthropomorphism. Anthro meaning human, morph meaning form or appearance, and it's a deeply ingrained human way of thinking about non-human things. This anthropomorphic bias is so pervasive, in fact, that it extends beyond animals. It extends to supernatural deities, to gods, to demons. It extends to cultural artifacts, um, including uh, various forms of literature and folklore. It even extends to inanimate objects. Against this broader tendency to view the world in our own image, it might seem perfectly sensible to project ourselves into the minds of other animals. And for the most part, it's relatively harmless. It can even be entertaining, as when we dress up animals in human clothing, we give them human gadgets and human personalities. As fun and entertaining as this might be, it's important to recognize that this is a fairly antiquated way of looking at other animals, and one that is increasingly out of step with the latest science of animal behavior and cognition. I want to challenge you today to think about animal minds in a different way, in a way that, that tries to understand and appreciate animals in their own right and on their own terms, in terms of what's known about their sensory systems, their nervous systems, their behavior, their ecology, their evolutionary history. As we learn more about the specific ways that animals come to perceive and understand the world, how they inhabit their world, we gain greater insights into how they think and how they feel, bringing the formerly invisible world of animal minds into sharper focus. So, how do we do this? To illustrate, let's return to dogs. What is it like to be a dog? Well, unlike with people, we can't simply ask a dog, what is it like to be a dog? But we can use the latest science from my field of animal behavior and cognition to try to piece together the unique perspectives that dogs have on the world. So, what can a dog see? Relative to people, dogs have a, a, a narrower range of vision. And unlike what you may have heard, Dogs are not colorblind, but they do see color differently than we do. What can a dog hear? Well, dogs have a keen sense of hearing, better than people, um, especially in the high frequency range. They can hear roughly two and a half time, um, octaves higher than people. This is the range in which dog whistles are effective. But as you dog lovers know, the dog's primary sense is olfaction, sense of smell. And 
what a dog can smell is pretty remarkable. You may know that dogs can be trained to sniff out drugs and explosives. You may even have heard that dogs can be trained to sniff out certain types of illnesses like diabetes and some forms of cancer. But did you know that dogs can smell gas and electricity up to 40 feet under the ground? How about this? Close your eyes and imagine your sense of smell expanding and overtaking your other senses. Keep going. Take it a bit further. Now imagine being able to smell a single teaspoon of sugar in a million gallons of water. This is roughly the size of two Olympic size swimming pools. You can open your eyes now. So this should give us some perspective, some appreciation for um, the world that our dogs inhabit. It's a world that is that overlaps with, but it's distinct from the world that we inhabit. So think about this the next time your dog barks at nothing, usually in the middle of the night, right? What is nothing to us might be something to your dog, something meaningful and, um, and highly salient. Of course, we can never get completely inside the skin of a dog or any animal for that matter. We are humans, after all, and we're, we're limited uh, by our own sensory capacities. But as humans, we can use our greatest tool, that of science, to better understand how the world shows up for other animals. What they see, what they hear, what they smell. We can use this same science to better understand what animals think, and what they feel. So let's return to this now familiar image. And let me ask you again, what is this dog feeling? Well, when viewed through a human lens, this certainly looks like guilt or remorse, yeah? When viewed through an animal behavior lens, however, a different picture emerges. Animal behaviorists recognize this type of behavior, the cowering, slinking, tail between the legs, as part of a larger pattern of submissive behavior that's rooted in dogs' evolutionary history and which all dogs display under threat. What threat, you ask? Well, when are you most likely to see this type of expression? Yes, when your dog is misbehaved, but also in the presence of a not so happy human. A human who may have just discovered trash can knocked over and smelly trash strewn about the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couch cushion that's been ripped to shreds. Chicken leg that's been stolen off the table. <laughs> Talking about your dog. <laughs> a not-so-happy human who is prepared to scold and reprimand. And in fact, research has shown quite um, conclusively that counter to our intuitions, this type of behavior is due not to remorse from some past misdeed, but rather to the dog's sensitivity to behavioral cues coming from its human companion. A human, it is studied extensively and knows extremely well. <clears throat> you see, dogs are exquisitely sensitive to subtle changes in our behavior. Facial expression, tone of voice, body posture. And the dog uses these cues to make predictions about things that are important in its world. And through these cues, dogs come to understand and know us, in some cases at least as well, if not better than we know ourselves. How many of you have had this experience? Uh, arriving at the door with the intent of taking your dog for a walk, 
only to find your dog already there waiting for you. Wagging its tail, <laughs> uh, ready for that walk. Your dog is picked up on a regular, predictable sequence of cues that in the past have resulted in a walk. Cues you yourself might not even be aware you're giving off. So it should not be surprising that dogs can also anticipate, again, based on the cues that we're giving off, whether they're about to be scolded or reprimanded. Hence, the submissive behavior. To me, this type of remarkable sensitivity to human social cues is much more significant. And it's, it's more impressive psychologically than human-like feelings of guilt and remorse that we project onto our dogs. Think about it. One of the things that we love about dogs is their zen-like ability to live in the moment, right? Why would we want to saddle dogs with human-like feelings of guilt and remorse? The guilt is coming from us, not from our dogs. Now, <clears throat> this does not mean that your dog is unfeeling, okay? Um, dogs have rich emotional lives, and I want to be very clear about that. But it's not a human emotional life. It's a dog's emotional life. And within the world that our dogs inhabit, there's simply no room for guilt or remorse. Dogs are not dwelling on the past. They're not worried about the future. And for a dog, this is a good thing. Dogs are just getting on with the business of being dogs, living in the here and now of dogness. So when we try to explain the mind of a dog, or any animal for that matter, it's, um, we need to gain a greater appreciation for um, the, the, um, the way that the animal experiences the world from their point of view rather than from our point of view. An animal-centered rather than a human-centered view of other animals. This point is amplified even further when we consider animals that are, are even more distant from us. Birds of prey with their keen sense of vision. Bats with their, elect, uh, with their um, echolocation. Electric fish with their electroreception. Imagine what it would be like to perceive and understand the world with a sensory system and a nervous system and an environment that's so radically different than ours. So rather than measuring animals against a human standard, an animal-centered view means trying to understand and appreciate animals for what they are. Even if the picture that emerges runs counter to our preconceived notions of what we think animals are or should be. Ultimately, a view that's informed by the latest science of behavior and cognition is more empowering to other animals than one that sees them merely as furry, feathered, scaly versions of us. So, the next time you stop to ponder what's going on inside the mind of another animal, rather than ask, what would I do under the, in this situation? I would challenge you to try to remove yourself and ask instead, how is this animal inhabiting its world? How is the world showing up for this animal? This is the better question, and one that's more likely to begin to uncover the invisible world of animal minds. Thank you.